So I'm just starting the video. This is uh, the lecture starting. Okay. So why don't we start with um, some introductions? So I'll start with myself. You know, you three know me. So, so this is. <laughs> why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> so it's Johnny, because these two I've already met. Oh, it's Johnny. Oh, you, have you met? No. No. My name is Janina, and I'm also in the Master of Genomics program. Okay. So we don't need to be writing up names and stuff, which is what I normally do. <laughs> um, because I think I've got you all and you've got each other, hopefully. Um, well, actually, I guess it's kind of... So it's... Uh, <laughs> Janina, <laughs> Alexander, uh, ELN. <laughs> And um, I guess it's, it's like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm Rob, as you know. I'm sort of boss of the group in environmental and resource economics. I'm like a macroeconomist, mainly macro and environment. And of course, some people, if you think about macro, they think about sort of the business cycle and stuff like that. That's not what I do. I'm doing the long run, big picture, growth, natural resources, environment links. So basically this course is about my research in a way, or they're very closely linked. Um, and actually having to take on this course has inspired a lot of my research. So we talk quite a bit about stuff that I've done research on. And you might think, oh, he just talked about <laughs> his own research, but it's more actually that I've done the research because of the course. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, yeah, I think that's enough about me, to be honest. I come from the UK, uh, but I'm also a Swedish citizen. I think I was, yeah, I was a Swedish citizen when I was. I think I just got that through. <laughs> More or less Swedish these days. Okay, that's me. Oh uh, yeah, and I guess since I'm going to ask you, <laughs> I have one undergrad from the UK in chemistry. Um, but I did my PhD here actually. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to tell us the same thing. Oh well, like. Where you did your undergrad, what program you're on, and a little bit about yeah. I could also say I'm going to ask you, uh, so like, where you did your undergrad, what program you're on, your interest within the subject area and um, if you could say something about your expectations for the course as well. And I guess I could say about my, I think I've covered these, <laughs> so my expectations, yeah it's going to be fun, I think, um, so I love teaching, I always look forward to teaching. Um, this is going to be different with so few of you, so I, I hope we can uh, have more in more of a discussion than I usually have when I give this course because I don't know in the past I felt like I got so much to teach and there's so much you don't know it's tended to be a lot of what the Swedes call Katia did under these things um, but this year with fewer of you I'm thinking I'm going to try and do put the Katia the stuff on the on little videos on quite a bit of it and we do more have more discussion it's not like we haven't had any discussions before but I, I always try to have discussions but I hope we'll have more this time 
and the videos will help with that. I'll talk about that later. What, how I'm going to planning to use the videos and stuff. Okay, so if you could just give us a quick, uh, <coughs> why don't you start, Janina? <coughs> I did my undergrad here at FLU and I'm in the Environmental Health Economics and Management program. Um, I don't know if I have like a specific interest. I feel like the whole course sounds interesting. I haven't checked into it. No. Oh wait, in the organization. I like environmental economics. I think it's very interesting. And I have heard that this course is really good, but hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <coughs> Good expectations, but I think it might be a little bit stressful. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I guess it's not really relevant, but if you want to say anything about plans for the thesis, it would be super interesting to hear as well. I'm putting you on the spot now. So. Uh, you don't I have no, I don't have a plan for my thesis yet. I'm trying to search for like master thesis from companies. Yeah, yeah. So you um, think it's on the it's on the radar for sure. That's yeah, because it but should I haven't be. really started that much. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah. And you said, yeah, you said you have broad interests, so that kind of fits that it. You know, some students it's like, okay, mm -hmm. I want to do econometrics or whatever, mm -hmm. and you know, and then it's kind of well, obviously you're going to do your thesis on that. Yeah. <coughs> Yo, uh, and my name is Alexander, and I did my uh, bachelor's at Uppsala University. Uh, I'm doing the environmental and uh, environmental economics and management program here at the Uh and. My interests, I guess I'm still trying to figure out what my interests are, but within environmental economics, for sure. And my expectations are that uh, the course is going to be tough, but interesting. Okay. <laughs> so we've got a ditto. A ditto, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as for my thesis, uh, I really don't know yet. Cool. So lots of <laughs> lots of details if I filled out. Yeah. But I guess the undergrad is different. So yeah. Other end of town. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I did my undergrad at Stockholm University. Um, I'm in the environmental economics program, and my interests are in uh, sustainable development and uh, like policies. I think, but also quite broad interests. Mm. Um, and uh, also efficiency analysis, which I want to write my uh, okay. thesis on. Uh, so the topics course, you did the topics course. Yeah. Is that? I know there's two of those topics courses. Did yeah, you do so the, the one on one efficiency analysis? The first one is in efficiency analysis that we did last year. Uh -huh. And this one was uh, uh, a bit broader. <coughs> and we got to write like a term paper for a research proposal. So okay. I wrote mine about efficiency analysis in Swedish dairy farms. Yeah. So I might want to do that. So okay, cool. cool. Yeah. And I also expect this course to be interesting, but I've also heard that it's quite hard. Mm -hmm. But I'm excited. I'm looking forward to the course. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> now maybe <laughs> we are just now terrified. Of <laughs> 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 I'm sorry about the hard part, but okay. Um, no, I did my bachelor's in uh, Austria in management and economics and now I'm studying at the Humboldt University in Berlin and I'm in the agriculture economics program there. Okay. Um, yeah, my interest, I also more the environmental economics thing and I like policy instruments a lot, so yeah, I don't know yet and I'm not really sure if I do my thesis next semester or the one after, so. But you're just here for this semester, or? Yeah, I try to stay another one if it's possible, but I don't know yet. So okay, yeah. You're welcome to come to the policy course in <laughs> <laughs> next term, <laughs> which is more. So in the normal way, the, poli the we have a course in environmental policy. I don't know if you've seen it, but normally that would be studied in the first year, and then this yeah. is the second year. But you're in your second year, right? Yeah. 
yeah. Because you should, according to the requirements, you should be basically to be able to get onto the course. Because it's, it's sort of supposed to be the toughest course. It's the only one where we require, I can't remember how many points, but you basically have to have a bunch of master's points in economics to be able to get onto this one. Because it's, yeah, I mean, it's right before the thesis, so. Okay. Right. So, I think what I'll do is actually put my slides up and talk through, use those first, and then I'll fill in the gaps. pretty much cold coming here, so to speak. Okay, maybe we should go here instead. Ah. The course is about the process of economic growth and its link to environmental quality and resource use. And as a, a sort of secondary aim is to teach you about the research process and scientific writing, because it's sort of the last chance for that. Hopefully you've learned a bunch about that as well in the last year and a half or so, but uh, I think I, after giving this course once or twice, it's always been in this position, it's like, okay, we need to spend this time on that as well. Um, basically, I took the course on, wow, about, well, it must be a long time ago, 15 years ago or something. <laughs> I've been here way, way too long. So I've been working permanently at SLU since 2003, the order of 2003. I probably took the course on 2005, 2006 or something. And I was like, well, I don't know, the course was quite a mess then. I mean, it's a really <coughs> tricky topic actually. Um, So I've been sort of building it up ever since. The first few years, a lot happened each year. I was like, okay. But then less and less happens each year over the last five or six or seven years. So as I build up material, I basically put together into a sort of compendium, which is now more or less a book. And I call that the Economics of Spaceship Earth. 
available to print out. Um, I'm working on an update for this year. It kind of peters out at the end, basically. Um, there's stuff that I want to add, or topics that I want to talk about, which I'm now, I mean, really now getting around to actually doing research on. I've been planning research on them for a long time. But now I've actually got something to say on them as well. So I'm working on improving that part, but it doesn't really, it's not really a part of the course actually. It's only an afterthought in the course. So the main material for the course is all there in last year's version. If you want a sort of base book, there's no, there's no good book out there which is covering this stuff, you know, a published book. So there's no real alternative to this. Of course, what there is is loads of different papers which I refer to. If you, if you want to <laughs> spend some money, <laughs> you could get this, which is just a basic book, uh, more or less the right level about growth theory. But it's fairly, I mean, it's sort of good background. It goes way more in depth on growth theory, you know, the nuts and bolts of the just pure growth theory than we do. Um, then, apart from my book, then I'm giving you here a sort of chatting about relevant literature. the different chapters, some of which is by me, most of which is by others, and then there's also like a formal reading list. So if you want to like show your, show someone, oh I did this course, and like maybe you, you know, they're saying, well is this course really economic? That's really the main purpose of this debate. Okay. Any questions before I go back to the overhead slide? Okay. Let's have a look at the slide. Okay. So economic growth on spaceship Earth. So this spaceship Earth metaphor has been around for a while. Here's one take on it. I, well, just, just read back if you don't want. So if you think about us being on the spaceship Earth, which we obviously are, you know, in a way, it's, it's a relevant metaphor. This is one way that it, that metaphor may lead your thoughts, kind of. But then, here's another completely different way. If you wanted to sum this up in one word, what would it be? <coughs> I'd say sustainability would be the obvious one with the modern <laughs> discussion. Right? What, what about this one?
like we're all stuck on this boat together, so to speak. We've got limited resources, let's make sure they get shared out fairly. Um, and basically, the point I want to make with this is just that the focus of this course is going to be the sustainability aspect and not the fairness aspect. But I want to, <laughs> I want to make the point that the fairness aspect is super interesting and relevant to study as well. But we're not going to do it in this course. And there is a bit of a problem, like, economists are not very good at this study in fairness. There are, of course, like, econ economics is like a sort of hydra. You sort of cut off one head and another one appears, or whatever it is. You can do anything with economics, you can study any kind of question. And, of course, there is a field of economics, quite a major field, looking at distributional questions of fairness. But it's tiny compared to other fields. And it's probably way too small compared to how important it is to people's lives. We'll come back to why we why economists don't tend to look at fairness, but I don't want to spend too long on that right now. So given that we're looking at sustainability or just in general, um, how to manage the economy. You can ask different questions about that, right? You can ask like, okay, what's desirable? What do we what do we want to achieve here? But you could also just ask, well, what is possible? And you could ask what is optimal. <laughs> so, no prizes for <laughs> guessing which is the classic economics question. Right? That's the optimality. Yeah. What's desirable? That might be a more of a philosopher, though, might not it? Like, what is a good life? Yeah. What, what should we really trying to achieve. But economists tend to uh, sort of deal with that question in a very simple way, don't they? And what's the sort of economics, the typical answer chosen by economists for that question? Give me some thoughts. That's Right, excellent. <coughs> we want to maximize utility. <coughs> so even plenty of philosophers would say that too. But you're totally right, that is what's the sort of starting point for a lot of welfare economics. But then the question is how do we decide when utility is maximized? Think of your welfare economics <laughs> 101 to use the American terminology. Maximizing the surplus measured in what terms? In monetary terms. Yeah. This is what we typically do in economics. And again, there's there's a whole field of research in like happiness research, and there's economists who are also like going looking at that and doing research on optimality based on broader criteria and so on, and environmental economists sort of including external damages and the value of the environment and so on. But typically, and even in environmental economics, you thought you, you're ending up in measuring things in monetary terms, of course. What's feasible, that's 
kind of the sort of engineer approach to it, isn't it? It's like you tend to just take take the other stuff for granted. And like, what what can we achieve here? Okay. So typically in economics, we have this utilitarian rule: we want to maximize the sum over household of utility of each household, typically. And the utility of a household, the big U, is the sum over time of that household's utility in each period, which is a function of... Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's a desperately emphatic, what do you say in English? Uh, narrow model of what is making us happy or what to aim for, right? And then we what's this? Apart from Zeta. If we took out this beta, this beta raised the power of T, isn't it? If we took it out, we can take that out, but then utility, the total utility is the sum over time, so this could be t equals naught to infinity of utilities in each period. So it's a discounting factor? Right. So it's raised <coughs> to the power t, isn't it? Because the longer the time gets ahead, so what, what can we say about beta here, the value of it? It's going to be less than 1, right? It's not like this is essential for the course, I'm just warming you up, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but there's totally other different criteria that some economists use in some circumstances. Like I was saying, in economics, you can do anything with it. You don't have to do it this way. So, can anybody read this for us? Talk to you. Talk to your neighbor or somebody talk to me about it. <laughs> <laughs> and two of you talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess that's based on my bit of ignorance. You know, mathematics okay, person who got it like for a school of the cycle. And the and the you know, the bit of ignorance. You know, the like vehicle like commission set up. Yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, sorry. Alexander, how do you read this? You, you got it. Can All you right. read it as if uh, it was just math? <coughs> so I think that. it's based on. Oh, sorry, now I interrupt. Can you just read it as if it was math? Uh huh, okay. So maximize uh, like the person got, I don't know, the, <laughs> the least utility in society. Right. Yeah. So you want to choose the, choose the option, the distribution of resources or whatever, which leads to the maximization of the least. The smallest element in this set would be. So you could have under here, you could have max. So really, you could have u, these u's could all be a function of some choice variable. And then you could have the choice variable here. And you could say choose. So actually, this isn't really a sort of full extending, it's not really complete. But if you had a the choice variable here and here, you could say choose this in order to maximize the smallest value of the elements in the set. So make the smallest value as big as you can. Which comes down to what you're saying. Say it if you just tell us the rule. Yeah. yeah, I think so. The idea is uh, if you have like if you don't know uh, where for deciding how the society should be like designed, and you don't know uh, how it would be, everybody would choose to like. Uh, well, I think that's the conclusion that you would want to maximize uh, the person who got it worse, like in society. Uh, the point is, you don't know who you're going to be, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And um, then roles play that yeah. if you were in this situation, you would choose this criteria for how society should be organized because you're very afraid of being that worst, least off, worst off person. But of course that is very open to debate whether you really would choose that. It's quite an extreme criteria. 
Like if you had a million people and you had an option where one of them had it pretty tough and all the others had it absolutely awesome, or you had an option where everyone had it a tiny bit better than the one who had it pretty tough. Would you really choose the second one? If you're behind that veil and you go, or would you take a chance? <laughs> it's an open question, but that was all you claim anyway, that if you were behind the veil, you would choose me. And you can, of course, build economic models based on this, and people have done that. You know, how should we organize societies if, if this is our decision? Okay. So what about how to manage the economy? If we get more specific, so this is about sort of outcomes. So this is more about how to actually get outcomes. So what would happen if we just let everyone get on with it? Yeah, laissez-faire. Of course, laissez-faire doesn't really exist, but you assume you were still assuming then that there's a sort of law and order and pro private property rights and so on are enforced. But within that, people are just free to trade and so on. No taxes, no regulation. What would happen if we had <coughs> business as usual, which is also kind of hard to define, but it's basically the idea that we carry on with more or less the system we've got today. Same kind of taxes, same kind of regulation. And this could be in a national economy or it could be in a global economy. And we're kind of taking a global outlook in this course, but we're not, we're looking very aggregated. We're not looking at sort of trade between sort of Africa and Europe and so on. Um, or you could get much more specific and say, well, what if we bring in certain regulations like tax fossil fuels, support research into renewables? What would a social planner do? So you three at the front, you know the answer. <laughs> what, what's this all about? Or do you have any idea? The, uh, what's a social planner or you are you familiar with the concept or? yeah I've heard it before <laughs> okay but not so much more than that yeah actually and it's also some people in economics use it in different ways so some use it just to mean a regulator but I use it in a very different way that it's something very different from a regulator um, so some one of you three remind us what's a social planner? It's an all-knowing person who is able to reallocate everything to be like at the optimal situation, situation or something like that. Right. So the social planner is a sort of all-knowing, all-powerful being of some kind. Perhaps not really a person, because it's sort of imaginary who can just tell everyone exactly what to do. And people don't mind getting told what to do. <laughs> okay, it's not like... Um, it's basically how, to, how they should allocate their resources. So like, should we dig up coal or oil or gas? Or have windmills? Should, should we have lots of people doing that? Or should we have more people doing research? And if they're doing research, should they do it on wind or solar? Should they make shoes or shirts or should we have more people on agriculture, etc. Okay. The social planner studies the economy and works out what allocation of resources would make people as happy as possible according to whatever the decision rule or the utility function is that we decided. <laughs> They're very interested in our course. <laughs> <laughs> Social planner takes the utility function, studies the economy, and then tells everyone what to do, and then everybody is as happy as they can possibly be. But the social planner doesn't <coughs> mean things like taxes and regulations and so on. The social planner just tells everyone what to do, and then what, what do we?
to recall the situation which the social planner achieved in two words. Right, very good. That wasn't what I was thinking of. Okay. But yeah, <laughs> that's exactly correct. If the, se if the second word is best, what, would, what do we say then? Um, First, best. best, yeah. So absolutely, socially optimal. But that is all, we can also call it first best. The social planner achieves first best. But then, what about a regulator? A regulator is someone like Stefan. Or, or uh, oh. I think I was in a dream world for a minute. I was about to say Barak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. Um, that is interesting. Victor, whatever. Let's take with Stefan. We don't know how lucky we are in Sweden. <laughs> well, Angela. Oh, how's my pronunciation? Very good. <laughs> um, so that's the regulator, right? So is, is Stefan or Angela, are they social planners? They're not, right? What, what do they do? They can't just tell people what to do. What do they do? Right. And this is what we talked about a lot in the policy course. <laughs> so they could like have taxes, subsidies, rules and regulations. You can't do, you're not allowed, mostly like you're not allowed, you can't really force people to do stuff, but you can tell them you can't do what they can't do. Tradable permit systems, of course, have come in, like the EU ETS, and so on. So, from the economic, from an economist point of view, how do we, if we, well, okay, from an economist point of view, how do we think about what Stefan is trying to achieve with his taxes, subsidies, rules? Permit system, according to our idealized way of thinking about things. Yeah. Well, what he actually achieves is second best. Yeah, you. I mean, you're totally on my wavelength. Mm -hmm. Ideally, he would like to get here, right? He'd like to get the same allocation as the social planner would choose if the social planner existed. But of course, he can't get there, and what he does achieve. If he does the best he can possibly do, given the prob some problems just can't be solved, then we call it second best. So this is just a sort of introduction to welfare economics in a way. And again, a little bit like Yeah, I'm going to skip to here. Um, in the course, we're basically going to focus on 2, B, and C, mainly. So what were they? What would happen to give a business as usual, and what would be the effect of regulation? So we're not focusing so much on optimization because it's tricky enough as it is when we're looking at these very big questions that we're looking at. So we're not spending a lot of time on trying to say what would be the absolute best possible, what would the social planner do, doing that kind of analysis. We're more just trying to say like what is actually going on in the global economy. Why have things been developing as they are and how are they likely to develop in the future if we just carry on in the same way? Just trying to get a handle on that is tough enough. Um, and then trying to get a handle on what, what regulations and so on might make a difference rather than or might 
move things in the direction we see as desirable, rather than trying to say, okay, what's the absolute best we can do, or what would be the absolute best that a social planner would do. So this is a way of making the problem more manageable. Actually, we did. <laughs> I don't think we talked about this. Um, so what the hell am I getting at here? Any thoughts? Do you have any ideas? Have you, um, have you, some of you have done a macro course in Uppsala, right? Did you talk about micro foundations in that? Probably. <laughs> You should have done, really. No. So, do you, have any, do you have any idea what micro foundations like are? Or Sort of old-fashioned macro, you just sort of wrote down equations and checked whether they sort of fitted aggregate data. I'm looking for something to rub out. So what's this equation saying? It's saying that production is a function 
of labour and resources. Okay. So these are the quantities. So this could be like tons per year of some stuff. This could be like the number of workers or year, work a year equivalents or something. We can think of it as the number of workers. <coughs> And this is the productivity of the workers, and this is the productivity of the resource in making this stuff. And then, <coughs> if we do a bit of math, we can basically derive from this that the shares of labour and the resource which the, the share of total GDP that goes to paying for labour compared to the share that goes to paying a resource should stay the same over time. And the share going to labour is actually 1 minus alpha. And the share going to the resource should be alpha. So typically we'd have capital here as well, right? But we skip capital to make it easy. So you could think of this as a labour capital bundled together. Does anyone have any idea what share of GDP does actually go to paying for resources? If you have a typical firm sort of making stuff, how much do they spend on buying natural resources? Things like oil and gas and a sort of average firm in percent. So is it like 60% on labour and capital and 40% on natural resources? Or is it 99.9 .9 on this and 0.1 on this? Or <laughs> Somewhere in between. <laughs> <laughs> Any guess? Anyone want to have a guess? It's not something you should know, but I just want you to think about it really. Let's take it, ask a more detailed question, or a different question. If you think about all the natural resources there are, which firms pay for, there's one which is totally dominant in terms of how much money goes to it. Which is that? Who gets rich on natural resources? oil, isn't it? Yeah. So it totally dominates all the others. If you add up all the others, it's less than what goes to oil. So then, how much of global GDP do you think ends up in Saudi Arabia? So to speak. Metaphorically, or plus all the other oil producers. That would be another way of asking the same question almost. Anyone want to have a guess? <laughs> Go on, have a guess. You don't fancy it. <laughs> it's, a, it's about three to five percent. It depends on the oil price. Like when the oil, if some, if you restrict supply. The price goes way up, and you end up. They end up getting more money. <laughs> Around about five percent. Okay, and it is pretty constant. Okay, like it fluctuates in the short run when the oil price price fluctuates, but in the long run, it stays more or less the same. So if this, is G if this is a log scale and you have constant growth in global product, this could be global product or global GDP, if you like. And then this could be the sort of WRR, the total spending on resources, the price times the quantity. Growing at the same rate, yeah. Which matches this equation. But does that then mean that this equation is a good description of what's going on and we can use this
for policy. It doesn't. Okay. So according to this, if we had some policy that could raise resource efficiency, AR, what would you generally think that would do for the for the quantity of resources that are needed? If we get more efficient at using the resources, hopefully you'd think it, we need less, right? But what would happen according to this? You can basically. I don't want to go through all the maps. It's not that much, but I still don't want to go through it. But you can take this outside and write this equation as AR to the alpha times a bunch of stuff, including R to the alpha, right? So then if you raise this, Is that going to make this go down? Doesn't look like it, does it? It's like, oh, we've got more productive. Typically, if, if the resource price is exogenous and given, this will go up. Because you basically raise productivity in the economy when you raise this. When you're thinking about it, given this equation, if you take this outside like that, we've got more productive the economy expands, we use more resources. Is that really going to happen? Why? You know, for this whole approach of just sort of writing down equations that seem to match the aggregate data is not good enough. Okay. Because then, especially if we're then going to try and make policy predictions, We need to know where this comes from, right? We need micro foundations. So imagine you've got a firm making hammers. Okay. And they have input, this firm has inputs of labor and energy. Okay. And we're going to ignore, there's got to, obviously there's going to be inputs of, inputs of iron as well. But let's assume the iron is free and in, available in vast quantities. So we don't we can we can ignore it as an input because it doesn't cost anything. We'll come back to that as well later in the course. Then imagine that we come up with a new technology that basically means we can melt the iron and make the hammers with half the amount of energy. So effectively, we'll call it R, but think of it as energy. So effectively then, we've come up with a technology that doubles energy efficiency. We've doubled AR. What is going to happen then? So the ratio, how much, what is going to happen to the ratio of R to L? If we double AR in this factory. So we've got a new technology that is basically twice as energy efficient. I mean, what would the natural thing to assume be? It would decrease. It would decrease. decrease yeah. It would. The first assumption would be, well, it's going to halve, isn't it? Compared to L, maybe the whole factory would expand because they've got this great new technology. But then L will go up as well, won't it? So R compared to L. So at that micro level, we would definitely expect, if this goes up, 
this will go down. But it seems that the macro level, that that doesn't hold. Okay. But if we want to understand policy or make good policies, we need to know why not, right? What's going on in between the firm level and the aggregate level? If we want to know what the effects of different policies are going to be. Okay, we need the micro foundations. We need to found, build our aggregate level equations on models of what's happening at the firm level and like you were talking about at the household level. How are households choosing how are firms, what choices are firms making and how does that lead to the aggregate stuff we observe? Then we can start having a model of what the effect of different policy actions would be. Okay. So this is super relevant for the course, okay, because this is kind of what we're doing throughout the course. Trying to understand what's going on based on the micro <coughs> building up from the micro level to the macro. Okay. And very broadly, we're going to start just by looking at the growth process. We're going to look at natural resources, and we're going to look at pollution. Okay, if you think about your development, it's like thinking imaginatively, analytically, presentation of ideas, writing ideas, programming, or work, simulation, programming, etc. Um, I used to try and cover all these bases, but as of about seven or eight years ago, I dropped this one and <coughs> focused on these three. Okay. Quite a big focus on this one, which is because of the motivated by the master's thesis coming up. I mean, it's super important, but it's doubly important with the thesis coming up. And obviously, a massive focus on the top one. As you guys at the front have heard, it's quite challenging, of course. Or maybe you just heard it's a lot. I don't know, or both. Yeah. Of course, it depends. If you find it easy, then it's not going to be too much either. But if it's tough, technically or whatever, then that also means it's likely to take a long time. Okay. So what I've seen from the evaluations over the years is that there's a huge variation in the amount of time that students are putting in according to what they fill in in the evaluation. So some students are saying they're putting like 40 hours a week into the course, which obviously, if everyone was saying that, that would obviously be completely <laughs> unacceptable. Um, but at the same time, there's plenty of students saying that they're putting in whatever, 15, 20 hours. Uh, okay, yeah, let's have a look at the grading criteria. So it's pretty straightforward. It used to create a huge amount of confusion, and then I created this picture, which seems to have sorted out, basically. So to pass, you need to pass the exam, which means getting 60%. You need to pass the Gobbits, which are the little essays that you guys have probably heard about. You talked to them a lot. Oh. And you need to pass your little research paper thing. Then, so you need to pass each other in the course. To get higher grades, you need to pick up bonus points. And there are, for the exams out of 60, you need 36 to pass. And if you get full marks, then you've got 60, which is then 24 bonus points. There are eight bonus points available on the Gobbits and eight on the paper. Probably the toughest.
toughest place to get bonus points is on the goblets. Okay. So don't think about the goblets as an obvious. Don't think about them primarily as like this is where I'm going to nail my top grade. Um, I would recommend you think about the goblets as a learning opportunity rather than an opportunity to uh, help with the grade. Even the best students, or the, the students who are doing great gobbets, or who are doing the best of all the other students on the gobbets, so to speak, are typically not picking up that many bonus points back. It's, it's tough to get a lot of bonus points back. Uh, Obviously, we'll talk about the the goblets and the research paper. We could talk about them now, or we can like do this a bit later when it's more. But any questions? So you're okay to park the discussion of these for now. Have a look at the blurb. Probably more efficient that way for the goblets than for the research paper, and then we can discuss it when we've looked at that, rather than me leading you through this stuff, which you can do on your own. <coughs> Okie doke. Let's have a look at the schedule then. I just want to get to the right one. It does, yeah. Okay. So I've got to meet the boss. I don't know if you've all seen this. But this one is going to have to move. Got to meet the boss. The big bad boss. I can't even remember what she's called. Our new rector. Anyone there? No. coming to our department. So we might be able to have it like two to five might be an option or we have to find another day for that. Um, maybe we should talk about that. I haven't really, oh I haven't even got my diary here. Yeah, perhaps we could, I'll go and get my diary in the next break. I used to, up until this year, I've had much more packed lectures early to kind of get the sort of more of this catheter thinking. But okay, I'm going to sort of give you the material and then give you plenty of time to think about it. But this year, because I'm going to put a lot more on video, I'm thinking that I want you to be much more keeping up with things throughout. You see what I mean? So therefore, partly that, therefore I spread them out. It's also because I've got, I'm away on trips and things. So it just was impractical anyway to do it that way. I've also cut out one lecture compared to previously. And I don't even know if we'll have, this could just turn into a lecture. This would be a, like a last chance to talk about whatever you want to do. Probably we won't have an exercise class as such. So last year was the first year I put out really good videos for the exercises. I don't know if those videos are still there. Yes, they are. Yeah. And we 
got to those, the first exercise class after Christmas, and it was like, okay, so what lunch beer? What do you want me to go through? And it was like, oh, nothing. <laughs> what is it? It's all on the video. four or five of us, we probably won't need that for a length of time. And that's more when there's 12 or 14. <coughs> okay. So, so, the, so the first seminar is to, uh, like, that's when we're supposed to start work? Does it research? Kind of, yeah. General equilibrium. What's a general equilibrium model? It's probably tricky, you know, give me some thoughts. It's not, I realize you probably don't have the answer on the two of your tongue. So, so Janina <laughs> obviously yeah. got something to say. No, I just, no. Uh, it depends on all markets. Okay, <laughs> that is <laughs> general equilibrium is when all markets are in equilibrium. But then a general equilibrium model oh. is a model that includes, I'm trying to give you a hint based on what Janina said. So general equilibrium when is, it is when all markets are in equilibrium. A general equilibrium model is a model which includes <laughs> all the markets. <laughs> okay. It's basically a model of the whole economy. Um, 
So you're modeling entire economies in general equilibrium models. Um, what does this stand for? CGE. You don't know? Okay, wow, I'm quite surprised. So this is computable general equilibrium. So these are like computer models with quite a bit of detail in. Compared to the true detail in the real economy, it's like 0.0000001%. But they're still quite detailed compared to other economic models. Yeah. There's like maybe hundreds of inputs and variables and things in these models that you stick into the computer and typically you have very simple relationships. It's like linear relationships in supply and demand and so on. So that's one way of modeling general equilibrium. Often you have these sort of input output. Have you heard of input output models? No. Um, you have this sort of structure with firms that are getting inputs in, producing outputs that are sent inputs for other firms, and you have this sort of regressive kind of structure or this uh, circular kind of structure in which you can actually end up working out how everything works through. That's not what we're going to do. In our general equilibrium models, they're going to be like ridiculously simple. Okay, so it's like we've got a household, we've got one type of firm that makes final goods, and then we've maybe got some other type of firm that is making electricity today. And then we've got labor, which can either go and work here or here. And the output from here is coming into here, and then this is the kind of thing, right? Why am I talking about that? Um, <laughs> what was I just talking about? <laughs> it was very important for me to explain general equilibrium. Play, play back the video. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, we were talking about the lectures and so on. So here this was kind of just partial. Yeah, we just looked at this production function could be the production function here. But we didn't look at, okay, how is it all hanging together? We're going to be developing different kinds of general equilibrium models with micro foundations, household preferences, firms at different levels and so on to try to explain what's going on at the aggregate. And basically my idea is each time we get to a model I've basically recorded a video for the, to where I've gone through the model, the math. And I want you to look at those videos before the lecture. So then, basically, I don't have to go through all these models and go through the math with in front of you guys. Instead, we can talk about the models, and if there's stuff you haven't understood or whatever, you can ask. But to me, this is like, for one thing, I think it makes sense that you have these relatively short videos. Because like you sit there and watch a video for an hour, it's like wow. So these, I hopefully we can keep them down to 15 minutes. Plus, <coughs> when you actually watch them, I would strongly recommend to uh, <laughs> speed them up. Because <laughs> otherwise, it gets pretty tedious. I imagine. It'd be like sitting in one of my lectures. Um, We're just getting a speaker from the computer in the corner. I don't know how to get the microphone going. <laughs> There's nothing about a microphone here. Holy. Okay, we're on max 
your volume. If it ever gets going, it will definitely. Okay, whatever. It's pretty slow, especially if you're sitting in front of the screen. But on YouTube, right, you can go. Maybe 1.5 is a bit more nargoma, you'd say. Okay. So I really, really want you to watch these videos before the lecture. Otherwise, the whole idea is gonna not gonna work. Okay. It's basically essential. Which is why I've already got these videos out for the next lecture, so we're not going to get to any of these today. So that's cool. Does that sound reasonable? And then basically I said, so we're spreading out the lectures, and the idea is that you'll actually get your heads around the models and the math. Encore, like throughout the course, kind of rather than like just listening to it all and then going away and trying to do it. So obviously for these videos, you know, you shouldn't just sit there listening. You should be writing stuff and testing whether you can do it on your own afterwards and things like that. So at least to some extent, obviously, you know, it's a question of time, of allocation of time and so on. So definitely some extent. But the absolute bare minimum is to listen to them before the lecture. Okay. <laughs> that is that. I think that is basically the main stuff I want you to know before we start. And I'm hoping that with this video plan that it's going to be, we're going to have, it's going to be a bit more relaxed in the lectures in the sense that we actually have time to talk about stuff. Because in the past it's been quite tough to just get through the material. Uh, questions, comments, whatever. No? Okay. So, should we take a 10 minute break, is that okay? And then we'll uh, kick off on the first actual lecture, so to speak, chapter one. Okay, so we'll see you back.